Yeah. All right, welcome everybody to uh, FBGA seminar. We have two talks today. The first talk is by David Galloway, entitled Ludiac Small Soft Processors for Small Programs. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, so my name is Dave Galloway. I'm going to be talking to you about Ludiac. It's a uh, research idea that uh, Dave Lewis came up with a couple of years ago that we looked at. Um, Ludiac is a soft processor. Um, the motivation behind it is, uh, you imagine you somewhere in your design you've got a very small computation that needs to be computed. Um, that can be described in a small number of instructions, say 200 instructions, and you need about 200 words of, of data to, um, to compute whatever it is. And you may be in a situation where you don't have enough room for a full-size soft processor. Uh, this especially might happen if you want uh, a large number of these processors all banging away at the problem um, all at the same time. So we're going to take a, a drastic step which reduces the size of the, the soft processor and gives you something that's, that's much smaller. And then I'm going to experiment with those uh, processors, measure their area and speed. At the end of the talk, I'll compare them to a standard soft processor, the, the NEOS 2 from, from Altera. So here's the idea. Um, this is a, a diagram of uh, a simplified view of the inside of a, a normal microprocessor. On the, on the right hand side here, we have a, uh, a data path. There's some uh, A registers and B registers. They feed into an arithmetic and logic unit. Uh, the output of the ALU goes back into the registers. On the left hand side, we've got the control path of the microprocessor. So there's a program counter and its incrementer. And that's used to uh, look things up in an instruction memory. The instruction is then decoded and used to drive these control points. Now, I've drawn some green arrows on the data path, and those are places where you have to tell the data path what to do. So, for instance, on the A register, it wants to know uh, which register you want to read from, right? So it's, it has a read address. It will also have a write address, uh, a signal to tell it whether it's supposed to be reading or writing. On the ALU, we need some inputs to tell it what to do, whether it wants to add or subtract or multiply. So this slide more or less says what I just said. There's a data path and a controller. The data path has control inputs that are driven by the controller. Now, these control inputs are all driven from the decoder in the control path. Uh, the decoder, in turn, gets all of its information from the current instruction. The current instruction, we get that from the program counter. Now, in the normal case, the, instruction, the contents of the instruction memory don't change over the life of the program, right? So that is uh, the current instruction is just a constant. Uh, if you know what the program counter is, then you know what the current instruction is. So if you follow all that logic, the control inputs that, that drive the data path and tell the microprocessor what to do are just a function of the program counter in this particular case. Now, if we've got very small programs, say we've only got 64 instructions in the program, the program counter is only six bits wide, right? And so each control input, because it's a function of the program, program counter um, is a function of only six bits. And that is basically just a six LUD. And um, you know, a lot of modern FPJ architectures are full of six LUDs. And in fact, the entire decoder is a set of six LUDs. And, and we don't really need the instruction memory at all, right? So we can just remove it. And so that is what we're going to do. We delete the instruction memory, and we produce LUDIAC, which is what we're calling LUDIAC. So it's basically a hardwired controller on the left-hand side there. It's driven from the program counter. That drives the control inputs and tells the data path what to do. Another way of looking at this is um, if you're writing a soft processor, at some point you have something in your, your code that, that basically says read the instruction from the instruction memory. So we have you know, instruction equals instruction memory of PC. And then we look at that instruction and decide what to do. So if the instruction is this kind of thing, then do this. And if it's that kind of thing, then do that. So we're going to replace that piece of your soft processor by just a case statement, which just looks at the program counter and then decides what to do. So um, if the program counter is 0, we're going to do this, like an add. If the program counter is 1, we're going to do this other thing, a clear, or whatever, and so on. So I've taken this simple idea, and I tried it out. I built a very... A simple prototype 16-bit processor. Um, it uses basically this hardwired program idea instead of an instruction memory. It has a three-stage pipeline. 
It's got a, a decode stage where you set up the read addresses on the, on the registers. An execute phase where you take the output of the registers, run it through the ALU, compute something, and then set up the writes on the, on the register file. And um, the write back stage where the register writes actually occur. It's all pipeline, so all those three of those things are happening at the same time. Um, this particular processor has one cycle per instruction. I made some other choices as well. Um, because we don't have an instruction memory, I don't have a fixed instruction set, so I'm not uh, limited by the number of registers that I can use in this processor. So I decided to merge the uh, data memory and the registers together into one big register file. Um, it does, the processor has to communicate with the outside world, uh, so it has one data input port and one data output port. And then I wrote a very simple assembler that just takes you know, a, a program written in assembler uh, and converts that program into an equivalent Verilog circuit that will implement that program. But once I did that, I ran some experiments to uh, see what we had, like how big these, these circuits are and how fast they will run. So I'm going to show the results of three different experiments. One where we're trying to measure the size and speed of the, the uh, circuit uh, compared to the complexity of the program that you use to create it. So uh, in particular, how many different kinds of instructions you're allowed to use. The second experiment, um, I want to measure the size of the circuit uh, compared to how many instructions you had in your program, so how long your program was. The third experiment um, you know, will increase the number of registers in the, the program, the number of registers you have to use to see what that does. Now, this, uh, this work was done about two years ago, so I was using Cortis 8.0, which was the, the, the version of Cortis we had at the time. And I was using the Stratix 4, which was the fastest uh, FPGA that we had available. Now, you don't have to know much about the insides of the, uh, F the Stratix 4. All of its logic are impl is implemented in something called a lab. And each lab contains uh, 20 flip-flops and approximately 10 six lots. Um, half of the labs in the chip can be converted from implementing logic to implementing a RAM. And that RAM would have 640 bits of memory in it. Um, and those, those labs that can do that are called M labs. Now, I'm going to compare the sizes of all these Radiac circuits to a real uh, soft processor at the end of the talk. But for now, um, just try and remember the medium size, the default NEOS 2 that you get, is about 58 labs and uses about 11 9K RAMs. Okay, so the first experiment, I'm going to uh, see what the complexity of the program does to the size of the circuit that it generates. Okay, so on this graph along the x, sorry, uh, along the x-axis, we have the the number of allowed instruction types that you use in your circuit or in your program. So each of these programs will have 64 randomly generated um, instructions, and they're chosen from the allowed set of instructions that I'm using for this particular data point. Uh, the y-axis uh, just gives the size of the circuit in labs. So this left-hand point, for instance, um, I'm only allowing one instruction type. So you have 64 instructions, but they're all randomly chosen from uh, the set of instructions you know, right here, which says you have 64 instructions that are all the same, and they're reading from the data input, and they're writing to some um, random data register. So that's a particularly boring circuit. And Cordis, the Cordis synthesizer that we're using to generate the circuit, uh, figures that out, so it generates a very small circuit that's only four labs in size. The second point, again, 64 instructions, but this time chosen from two uh, allowed instructions. So it's a, a random mixture of read data input and then add, um, and so on. So the right-hand point is 64 random instructions, but chosen from this, this entire list of 10 different instruction types. Uh, question for Jonathan. Question. How many control points are being driven? And, and is that the gives you the minimum number of six LUTs that you need? Um, yes, it does. Uh, I'd have to add them up in my head. But basically, um, you're going to have two register banks, each with a read address port. Um, now, depending on how many, how, how big that uh, uh, register bank is, that determines how many bits you'll have in that address. And so each one of those is a, is a point. Is a, is each one of those has to be driven with either a 0 or a 1. So yes, it would be a 6-input function that um, you know, 
generates one output. So basically, you add up all of those, and you get sort of the size of the circuit in theory. Yeah. And, and did you make that get bigger when you merge the register file with the data memory? Um, possibly. Huh. Yeah, okay. it's one of the things you would have to experiment with. Um, sorry, OK. So uh, this next slide is exactly the same experiment, except instead of measuring the size on the y-axis, we're measuring the speed of the generated circuit, like how fast you can actually clock it. So the boring circuit, the one that just does the same thing over and over again, can run it at incredible speed, nearly 500 megahertz. But as the uh, program gets more complicated, the circuit gets slower, and it drops down to about 200 megahertz for the most complicated one. Now, the next experiment, uh, we're going to take, um, we're going to keep the complexity the same. So we're going to have 60, well, some number of uh, instructions chosen randomly from that set of 10 different uh, uh, instructions, so the most complicated case. But we're going to, uh, on the end, sorry. Um, we are going to uh, vary the number of instructions in the program all the way from, I think, 16 up to 512. Now, this one produced a surprise. This this is not what I expected. I was expecting a knee in the curve, just around 64, where uh, once you went beyond 64 instructions, uh, you can no longer generate control path as just a set of six LUTs, because the program counter would now have seven or eight or nine bits in it. And I was expecting a quarters to trip over that. But no, it in fact is doing a fairly good job of keeping uh, the size increase linear with the size of the program, all the way up to 512 instructions. Now, the, I mean, the lab count is going up, right? You're up to 35 labs or so at the, the right-hand side. Um, but the size is growing roughly uh, for one lab for every 20 instructions that you add. And the Fmax is also quite good as well. The circuit stays um, uh, at about the same speed, at about 200 megahertz. In this next, next experiment, I'm taking the most complicated uh, circuit from the previous experiment. So 512 randomly generated instructions from a mix of 10. Um, but now I'm varying the number of registers, the number of data registers that it wants to use, all the way from, I guess, 16 again up to 512. And again, the size increase is fairly linear. Um, basically, the circuit is uh, growing by exactly the number of M labs you would need in order to hold those registers. Um, and uh, OK, now this is not the most efficient way of, of holding those registers. Cordis would really like to uh, start converting that register bank from M labs into uh, the block RAMs, which are more area efficient, uh, especially when you get on beyond about 96 of these registers. And uh, it would do that automatically, but I was telling it not to, just for ease of comparing the size of these things in, in this particular experiment. The Fmax is. Uh, starting out at about 200 megahertz and dropping off slowly to about 175 megahertz at the end there. Good question? Yeah. Another question? Uh, I, guess, I just wanted to understand about the, the random programs or sets of instructions. Yes. So does the processor ever stall? Like, does an instruction cause pipeline to stall? Um, or is IPC always one? IPC in this particular um, set of experiments is always one, so we don't have any stalls in the so does the instruction mix actually matter? Um, the instruction mix uh, does matter in that, well, in that first experiment, we saw that the instruction, if the instruction mix was very simple, then you, it generated a very small data path. OK, so if, if you are if certain instructions you're just not using at all, then that support is taken out of the process. That's correct, right. yes. So when you start to do larger, I guess what I'm wondering is when, when you use we're selecting 30 instructions, there was some odds that there was still would be some instruction not included. That's possible. Yes. That, so that's why you still see some effect. Yeah, you would see a, a small effect um, Sorry. Uh, on this graph, uh, the program size. In the, when we're choosing a very small number of instructions, that's correct. We may not hit all of the 10. Right. And so that might give you a, um, some small effect on the uh, Okay. On the side. And then by the time you get large enough, the odds are really low that you missed an instruction, so you're probably supporting the full process. That's correct, yeah. Once okay. we get beyond 32 or so instructions, we're right. pretty guaranteed to have hit them all. Okay. Um, 
Okay. So just one follow-up. So if you had an ad that produced a result and then the next instruction used that result, that can be used straight away in the next instruction? I have a slide on that near the okay. end, okay? Mm -hmm. it's on, that's about bypass registers, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, Size, number of registers. Okay, this last experiment, um, we are interested in the case where you want to have a large number of these processors all in the same chip, so I wanted to measure what the effect of that would be. So I took the same uh, random Ludiac core, it's a fairly small one, 64 instructions, and uh, I, I put a bunch of them in the chip, I chained them all together, I connected their output register to the next guy's input register, and then let Cortis just lay them down however it wanted. And again, the size is, is rising fairly satisfactorily. It's, it's linear. Uh, it appears to be using about 14 and a half labs per, per core. Uh, and I took it all the way up to 256 cores. Um, the Fmax is dropping off. It starts at 200 megahertz and then drops off slowly to about 150 megahertz as Cordis gets more and more confused about what's going on as the circuit gets more complicated. Um, we could have fit a lot more of these into the chip. Like, we're not actually using all that many labs. Uh, the the bottleneck was that each one of these cores is using a DSP block uh, to do multiplies. And um, I ran out of DSP blocks. I couldn't get 512 of them in, here in the chip that I was using. Okay, so now what happens, you know, what does this mean? What, how do you compare this to a real soft processor that, that you would use normally? Now this is going to be a very inexact comparison. I didn't spend a lot of time on this. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why this might be inaccurate. Uh, MIOS 2, for instance, is a 32-bit processor, and Ludiac is a 16-bit processor. And MIOS 2 is a real processor. It's got all the things you need, like it has memory interfaces and caches and trap support and stuff like that, and, and Ludiac does not. Um, I'm going to configure some MIOS 2 systems with a small amount of memory, say 4K bytes of RAM. Because it's a 32-bit processor, that means you've got about 1,000 words that you can use for either instruction or data. Uh, Ludgak, on the other hand, I'm not going to use any of the block RAMs. I'm going to force it to use put everything in uh, M labs, just to make it easier to um, to measure. Um, but that's probably not the most area efficient way of doing it. Um, one thing that is similar between the two processors, they're both using the multiplier in the same mode, and so they're both using the equivalent of, of four 18 by 18 bit multipliers or, or one DSP block. Maybe half the DSP block. I've forgotten how that works, um, but that part is the same. So here are the raw numbers. I've got two Ludiac cores up there at the top, a small one with 64 instructions and 32 registers, which takes up about 14 labs, and a large one which is 512 instructions and 128 registers in its 48 labs. Uh, at the bottom, there are three standard um, versions of the NEOS 2 processor. There's the small one, which is the NEOS 2E, and it's 37 labs and six of uh, the M9K uh, block RAMs. Um, it, uh, it has a very high Fmax, but it isn't pipeline. It takes five cycles to execute each instruction. The, the default NEOS 2 is the NEOS 2S. That's the one you get um, if you don't say anything, if you don't care. Uh, it's 58 labs and 11 M9Ks. Um, and it, has a it is pipeline. It has a cycle per instruction of, of between one and two. And unfortunately, I don't know the actual answer for that. And the fastest NEOS 2 is larger, 84 labs and 16 M9Ks, um, and, but it has a higher Fmax. It also has instructions per cycle, uh, cycles per instruction, um, between 1 and 2, and it will be faster than the NEOS 2S, but again, I don't know the real answer. So here's a back of the envelope type computation of the speed difference. It will be plus or minus a factor of 2. If I take a 16-bit Ludiac and I just increase the uh, size of the data pass to 32 bits, um, it uh, gets roughly twice as big. So I ended up with something that was 25 labs in size. And it was slower. It was about 177 megahertz. Uh, so if we just look at the speed ratio, Ludiac doesn't look all that good because it's slower than NEOS 2. NEOS 2 has been optimized by a lot of people who are good at this over a number of years. And so um, we are slower, 177 over 235, whatever that works out to be. Then if we look at the area ratio. Um, if we add up the size of a Ludiac, 25 labs, and a DSP, and the size of the NEOS 2S, the default NEOS 2, 
um, 58 labs, 11 and 9 kids, et cetera. If we, get, if we add up the areas of all those things, we get an area ratio of about 0.3, so Lady Arc is much smaller. Now what we're really interested in is how much computation you can get out of a unit area of silicon. So to do that, I divide those two numbers together, um, and I get that the 32-bit Ludiac would be about two and a half times as area efficient as the NEOS 2 for executing some particular program. Now, in the last point, what happens if we take the smallest NEOS 2, so the NEOS 2E? Um, it is smaller, but it's also slower. So when you do the computation, uh, it works out that Ludiac looks even better. It's about four and a half times as much uh, computation out of the same area in the same amount of time. So I'm just going to run through the, uh, the disadvantages and advantages of this approach um, and then uh, conclude. So the disadvantages are fairly obvious. We are limited to a small number of instructions, so you can only do a small amount of computation. Um, and the, even worse, um, you have to be pretty certain about what you want this program to do. Every time you change an instruction in the program, uh, you don't just change the instruction RAM, you have to, have to actually resynthesize your entire circuit. So that's going to be a pain, especially if this is part of a much larger circuit. Um, uh, Jack? Or just the right, right, right. right. That's what? Why, was, why is the number 200? So uh, I picked that out of the air. Okay, so it, so really it's kind of a trade-off as, as that number gets bigger, your FMAX goes down. Yeah, it, it's completely a trade-off. Uh, it's it's not really, FMAX seems to be fairly stable, but um, the, the size just starts to get ridiculous. And, and you are paying a, you know, a price and convenience for using this as well. So I'm saying, you know, as a rule of thumb, maybe 200 instructions. Okay, but there's no hard the, limit. The rule of thumb, beyond which you probably just want in the odds. Yes, to, I would say so. Yeah. Um, uh, now to get around this disadvantage of having to resynthesize every time, you could, you know, if you had really good simulation tools, this wouldn't be a problem. Or perhaps you could build a debug version of this processor that did have an instruction memory, and once you were really certain of what your program wanted to do, you could replace it by the real thing. So it may not be too much of a problem. <coughs> uh, there's a number of advantages. Um, the circuit is smaller and less complex than a standard uh, soft processor. I, I end up with one less stage in the pipeline. Because we don't have an instruction memory, we don't have to wait around to read the instruction from the memory. We know immediately what's going on. So that takes one cycle out of the pipeline. Um, more interestingly, the, the contents of your program are now exposed to uh, the logic synthesis process. Um, Cortis can see exactly what it is you want to do and it can tell uh, what parts of the data path you're using and what parts you aren't, right? If you never use the multiplier in your program, Cortis will automatically remove the multiplier because it, it basically is all fed by zeros and no one's looking at the output. Um, and this will make the circuit smaller and, and faster. Uh, I didn't have to do anything to make this happen, right? This just automatically happens by the way that synthesis works. The Luddy Act can be very flexible and very powerful. We're, we're not limited by a fixed instruction set. Uh, you can put in a large range of useful instructions um, that grows over time. And if you, if you don't use them, then they'll automatically be synthesized out. So you're not paying a price for those. Um, and it's also easy to add more specialized instructions to the data path. If you need some whiz-bang thing for this particular program, you can just add it, add it in easily. Uh, again, we're, we're not limited by the fixed instruction set, so you're not limited to, say, 32 registers or, or 16 registers. You can use as many as you want. Um, some other advantages. Um, the program self-configures. Um, so Cortis just looks at your program and immediately figures out what to generate. We don't need a GUI uh, where you say, oh, for this particular processor, I don't want a multiplier, or I do want this, or I don't want that. So it makes it slightly more convenient. Um, the data path can also adapt to your program in ways that might be a little surprising. So Jason's example of uh, a bypass register, if, if um, in any processor, not just a soft processor, but if uh, an assembler instruction tries to access uh, the value of a register that was written to in the previous instruction, um, that causes a problem because, because everything is pipelined that value hasn't actually been written to the register yet. Um, so what you normally do is you produce something called a bypass register, which saves the value of the, the last, the, the thing written by your previous instruction. 
And if you want to see it immediately, then you get it from the live grass register rather than the real register set. Now, because the data path can see your program, uh, it can immediately tell whether you've ever actually done this in your program. And if you have, then it does have to put in the bypass register into the data path. But if it can see that you've never done this, then it can leave the bypass register out, and that makes this, the program smaller. Uh, another example is um, you're not limited to simple instructions in this, uh, in this processor. If you want to do something like a VLIW where you've got several ALUs or uh, an adder and a multiplier all running at the same time, you can do that. And again, the, the uh, data path can look at your program and see whether you've done this. If you haven't done it, so say you have an adder and a multiplier, but you never use them in the same uh, cycle, then they can both share the same address registers um, because they're never going to be trying to read from them at the same time. Um, if, however, you have done this, then you can reconfigure the data path automatically so that it will generate a second set of registers for the, the, the multiplier so that they can read independently. Dave, are you saying that that all happens automatically due to synthesis because, it, because it's encoded in the Verilog? Um, Quartus isn't doing it. it. I did encode it in the Verilog, but it huh. is automatic in, in that sense. Um, it's a little tricky, but it's not difficult. Understand that it's not the time to explain it. I see. Um, so, uh, this is the last slide. Um, so, for small programs, it is possible to generate a soft processor that's, that's small, 12 to 25 labs um, plus the multiplier. And this will be smaller and faster than the smallest uh, NEOS 2. And it's going to be approximately the same speed, or at least the same uh, instructions per second, as the uh, sort of the default <coughs> NEOS 2. But the, the size advantage that we're getting here will totally evaporate uh, once you approach about a thousand instructions. Beyond that, it's just not worth doing. So that's it. Are there any questions? Uh, you're using primarily uh, random instructions for your experiments. I was wondering if uh, you did a, a measurement to see if, given a program that actually computes something, uh, does those results still match with the, uh, the values that you got for the random uh, Programs. Okay, so so do the random programs sort of match anything in the real world? And the answer is, um, it's a good question, and I don't know. Um, how does it compare to custom hardware? It, since the program is small, right, probably you can use high-level synthesis tool to achieve better results. Um, so using ASIC, you mean? Yes. Um, yeah. no, just use high-level synthesis tool to do the synthesis. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to that either. It's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, it, could you automatically convert what it is you wanted to do in your program into some Verilog data path that, that did the thing um, more efficiently? And um, the answer is probably, but I don't know how to do it. Um, is there a way in this approach that you could uh, make uh, like com compound instructions more easily so that y y you brought it over from some standard uh, assembly language mm -hmm. or instruction set but is it like, I can't quite think my way through this so I want you to do it can you can you make uh, more complex instructions uh, that do lots of things all at once or is it, they were limited by your data path um, okay can you make more complicated instructions out of uh now, if you started with a program which just did one instruction per cycle, could you automatically maybe produce something that did several instructions per cycle? Yeah. Um, okay, I don't know the answer to that either. I did experiment with that a little, starting with um, assembler programs like that, and so by hand, um, trying to think up instructions where I could do several things in the same clock cycle and compress the size of the program. Using the same data path you, that you had or by augmenting the data path? Augmenting the data path so that you have things that would operate in parallel. Um, but I was doing it by hand and I really don't have any conclusions. It, 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 it could be done, but I don't know how hard it is. Well, let's thank David for an interview.